Okay, so I think we can we can start. Um, I just prepared uh, a quick summary. of uh, what did, what we did um, yesterday. So uh, <clears throat> the uh, problem that we are trying to, uh, to solve is about the so-called oblique uh, procrastis uh, problem. So essentially we have a, a linear system um, of equations. So X is our unknown, A is the matrix of coefficients uh, that we assume to be equal to of size M times N which in general M a uh, number of equations larger than the number of unknowns. So the system is in general over complete with a, a quadratic constraint on the, on the norm of the, uh, of the solution. And by, uh, sorry, this one is. So by computing the, uh, introducing a, a Lagrangian that takes into account uh, this constraint and computing the critical points, uh, we get to uh, an equation for the uh, solution in terms of the matrix W, which is the Wishart matrix corresponding to the matrix of uh, coefficients. And we have uh, an equation that fixes the uh, Lagrange multiplier. This equation depends on uh, random uh, objects that are the eigenvalues, the positive eigenvalues of the Wishart matrix uh, W and uh, the component essentially of the noise vector uh, B, okay? And in general, we have a profile of this function on, on the left-hand side that must match this constant N over sigma, sigma square. And depending on the level at, of the noise at which we, we, we cut this equation, we get a number of uh, real solutions of, of this equation, which gives the number of critical points uh, irrespective of their type, irrespective of whether they are minima, maxima, or, or subtle in this large dimensional, uh, large dimensional space. Can you remind us where, where, where is the noise? The, the noise here is uh, essentially in the term B and in the matrix A. So A with sigma, sigma square. So we define essentially B as uh, sigma okay. psi, where psi is, uh, is a Gaussian vector with mean zero and variance one. Okay, so uh, we uh, wanted to compute the average number of uh, critical points, irrespective of whether they are minima, maxima, or, or saddles. And uh, after averaging over B, and then averaging over uh, the matrix, uh, the, the, the matrix W, which we uh, represented in uh, this uh, form we ended up with a, a formula with a known constant that depends on n, m, and, and sigma, an integral over lambda, the one of the n plus one degrees of freedom, n are the number of components of x, and then plus one, which is the uh, Lagrange multiplier, the, an integral over q, which will produce a Bessel k function uh, that comes from, from a change of variable, and then the remaining, uh, the remaining important uh, bit that we wish to, to compute is this phi function, which is an integral over essentially Wishart uh, matrices of size n minus one, but with an extra absolute value of, of this uh, determinant um, that comes from the katz uh, from the Jacobian in the katz uh, formula, okay? So this is the main technical hurdle that, that we, we would like to um, to overcome, and this can be uh, done, and this is the last thing that I wanted to, to show you, thanks to a trick that, that is due to, to Jan, uh, Jan Fyodorov. So the evaluation of this uh, integral proceeds separately, uh, depending on whether lambda is larger than zero or lambda is smaller than zero, but I will only do the case uh, lambda larger than zero for uh, time, um, time reason. So the uh, idea to solve this integral is to first uh, perform an orthogonal decomposition of the matrix uh, W, which is Wishart, uh, in terms of eigenvalues S1, uh, S n minus one, and then O uh, minus one, where O is an orthogonal uh, matrix of size n minus one. 
if, uh, if we do that, we notice that essentially this integrand is uh, rotationally uh, invariant. So it will only depend on the eigenvalues uh, here. So uh, the measure, the uh, W, uh, gets transformed into uh, an integral over the orthogonal uh, group, an integral over the uh, eigenvalues, and then the Jacobian of this uh, transformation which is given by the Vandermond uh, determinant in uh, n minus one um, variables. So I, I put uh, a pointer uh, to this um, transformation law in the handout. I think it's equation, uh, equation 15. So this uh, delta object is just the product j is smaller than k of sj minus sk, okay? So it is an object that contains the differences of all the eigenvalues uh, evaluated. Yeah, the n minus one eigenvalues of uh, of this matrix. And there is a, a pointer to a derivation of this uh, of this fact. Okay. Now, uh, noticing the rotational invariance, I mean, we can we can proceed formally by changing variables and having an integral over the unitary group, an integral over the uh, eigenvalues. All these terms can be expressed in terms of the eigenvalues uh, alone, right? So we get exponential of minus n over two, summation k one to n minus one sk. And then we have a product uh, from j or k from one to n minus one of sk raised to the power m minus n minus one over two. And then this, this term here can also be written in terms of uh, uh, the eigenvalues only. Uh, this would be the product k one to n minus one of the absolute value of lambda uh, minus sk. And then we have the absolute value of the van der Mond, uh, determinant in uh, variables of size uh, n minus one. Okay, so this integral over the orthogonal group is just, uh, it, it's the volume of the orthogonal group essentially. So it is a known uh, constant. Uh, we, we don't care, we will absorb all the constants uh, in, in the main constant here. So now we have this, uh, this integral, this n fold integral, n minus one fold integral over the uh, eigenvalues. And uh, what Jan Fyodorov noticed is that we can lump uh, these two terms uh, together using the following uh, identity. So the absolute value of the van der Mond in uh, n minus one variables times the product k one to n minus one of the absolute value of lambda minus sk can be written in terms of the van der Mond in n variable s1 sn so we are enlarging the space we go from n minus one to n variables then we stick in here a delta uh, that lambda that sn is equal to lambda and then we are integrating over Sn. So this, uh, this uh, an equality and identity that you can essentially prove, uh, prove directly. You, you just write the uh, van der Mode determinant, which is this object uh, here, and you recognize that the terms in this van der Mond, the in this extended van der Mond determinant that pertain to the lamp to the Sn eigenvalues are the product of Sn minus S1, Sn minus S2, Sn minus, you know, Sn minus one. And all these you can write into uh, using this delta function, all this Sn becomes become equal to lambda, which reproduces exactly uh, this term, uh, this term here. So using this, uh, this trick, which is a, a fundamental uh, observation, we can rewrite this uh, integral in a much more convenient uh, form. The absolute value is, is in here as well. Yes, yeah, sorry, of course. Thanks. 
Thanks. Yeah, that, that, if, if this were so simple that we could get rid of the absolute value, no, thanks. We wish, yes. Okay. Okay, so what we have, thanks to this uh, identity, is that this integral here, we can extend it uh, to include uh, a further variable. So ds1, dsn minus one, and then we add an integration over dsn, and we write something like exponential of minus n over two, summation k one to n, sk so we extend this sum up to n remember it was up to n minus one and of course we need to correct for the for the nth term in this uh, in this exponential so we write here in front exponential of n over two times sn but sn is equal to lambda okay then we extend also the product the product of eigenvalues k from one to n of sk to the power m minus n minus one over two. And of course we need to correct this. So we need to divide this by sn to some power, but sn is lambda to the m minus n minus one over two. So we do this uh, corrections and then we have a van der Mond in n variables of our vector uh, of eigenvalues times a delta that fixes that lambda is equal to Sn. And now we are uh, essentially, uh, essentially done because we are recognizing in, in this uh, integral here, this integral with this uh, term, the joint probability density function of the Wishart ensemble of the eigenvalues of the Wishart ensemble of size n, which I give in equation two of the, of the handout. And with this extra delta here, this becomes just the marginal of the joint PDF. So this is just the spectral density, okay? So we have related the average of the absolute value of the determinant of a Wishart to the spectral density of a larger Wishart. That's, that's the, the essence of this, uh, of this trick. And if, if you are not totally mesmerized by this trick, uh, well, I don't know what, what will, will do it for you, okay? So this is just a wonderful, wonderful trick, isn't it? So this object here, this entire integral is nothing but the spectral density, let's call it rho n of lambda, of a Wishart matrix of size uh, n, by, uh, n by n, which is known in closed form in terms of uh, Laguerre uh, polynomials. So I give I give a reference uh, to this in the uh, in the handout as well. So everything now is written in terms of quantities that either are known or can be easily uh, easily computed. The problem effectively is is solved. Remember that it uh, had to start with this lambda larger than zero hypothesis. Why? Because in order to recognize that this object is the spectral density of an enlarged Wishart, we need to impose the constraint that lambda is positive. Okay, because the, the Wishart matrix has, has positive eigenvalues. So for lambda negative, we have an entire set of arguments, but luckily uh, the case lambda smaller than zero is not as uh, interesting. So the average number of uh, critical points of all types is essentially the sum of two contribution, n plus and n minus, where plus and minus are the sign of, of lambda. So you need to, to split these two contributions. Yeah? Sorry? 
Sure, but you cannot connect it. It, it is no longer true that. Uh, Uh, you don't have to worry about uh, the absolute value. Uh, yeah, true. But uh, so you, you, you have to do the computation and you cannot relate it no longer to the spectral density of, of Wishart. So you, you solve one problem, but not, not the, full, the full story. So the, the, the absolute value is a problem in general, not in that, in that case, but you cannot relate, you can no longer relate it to the spectral density of, of a larger Wishart. Um, okay, so essentially uh, the uh, the problem is is solved. All you have to do is to take uh, this formula here and stick it into the, the the formula that I gave you before. And there are two remaining integrals that are left: the integral over lambda and the integral over q. One gives a Bessel function, and there is a surviving integral that is difficult to to write in closed form. So in the end, you you get a final formula that I can write. Uh, for n plus, of course. Uh, so you, you have a certain constant that depends on m and, uh, and sigma, and this is fully explicit. And then you have an integral over lambda um, of exponential and lambda plus one over sigma square root of lambda. And then you have rho n of lambda, some combination of Laguerre polynomials, times the integral over q of q to the m minus n minus 2 over 2, exponential of a certain combination here, another constant, times q plus 1 over q. So this integral becomes uh, essentially a Bessel function, and this other integral uh, must stay this way, because it is, I mean, you can, with a lot of work, reduce it to a finite, finite sum, but it's not much more illuminating. Okay? But essentially, the problem is solved because you can plot this, uh, this function explicitly. Why did I say that uh, n minus is not very, very interesting? Well, you, you understand it from the uh, finite n picture that I drew uh, before. You remember, you have something like this. So the the, the lambda negative, uh, so the intersection of, of this horizontal line that gives uh, an inter an, a negative intersection, uh, you, you can see from here that the intersection can either be one or zero, essentially. So if, if, the, if the horizontal line is here, you have one negative intersection. If you have a horizontal line that is here, you have zero negative intersection. So for, for large n, this object is essentially either zero or one. And for, for, for even if you take the average, essentially you have a situation where n plus starts from 2n and goes down to 1. That's the, the result if you plot this function here. And then you have n minus that starts from 0 and quickly raised up to 1 here. So if you put together these two, two terms, then you, you get, let me change color. Then you get that the average number of critical points has precisely this smoothed version of the staircase where the number of critical points goes from 2n when we are up here down to just two critical points, a minimum and the maximum where we are down, down here, okay? So I, I just showed quite quickly, but with all, all the steps that, that this problem can be solved completely for finite n, if of course you are not interested on the type of critical points that, uh, that you have uh, here. If you, are, if you want to distinguish whether you are talking about a minimum, a maximum or a saddle, the problem is orders of magnitude more more complicated, and for this particular problem, we don't know the answer, okay? The reason is that in the cuts rise formula, you need to put an extra constraint that you want the Hessian to be, for example, positive or negative. And, and that constraint is something that we, we cannot easily uh, handle with this, with this formalism. 
Okay, so what I wanted to do uh, now is I wanted to go back to a more uh, perhaps uh, stringent uh, question, which is the statistics of the smallest solution. Okay, can I can I raise everything? And I'm happy to take questions if uh, if there's any. So I will keep the um, I will keep this sketch here. So let's go back to the uh, equation for the uh, Lagla Lagrange uh, multiplier, which is, let's call it G of uh, lambda, which is the left-hand side of this, SI divided by lambda minus sigma I, SI, sorry, square psi T VI square, and this must be equal to one over sigma square. So every, every real solution of this uh, equation provides an intersection here. And uh, each of these intersections correspond to uh, uh, a critical point of, of our loss function, of our constrained loss function, okay? So uh, this is of course a random function of lambda. And in particular, what is, uh, what is uh, interesting for us, the most interesting of these intersections is this guy here, because it is the smallest solution of this uh, equation, which according to Brown theorem, corresponds to the smallest value of the loss function. And the smallest value of the loss function is what we are, we are interested in, because that's, that's an indication of whether our system is compatible or non-compatible in, in large dimensions. Okay, so we want the statistics of this guy. And to do so, we try to average this equation over the uh, disorder with the condition that lambda must be smaller. So this is lambda. Lambda must be smaller than S1 at the smallest eigenvalue of our wishart. okay? In this way, we are singling, we are singling out the, uh, the smallest eigenvalue here, okay? So we are singling out the smallest um, Lagrange multiplier, okay? So if we average this equation and we try to solve it with the constraint that lambda must be smaller than the smallest eigenvalue, of the Wishart matrix, then we have some chance to uh, characterize the smallest value. Sorry, I mean, it's, it's either this one or this one. You, you need to imagine that you have only one cut here, okay? So you have only one cut. And, and whatever, whatever is the, the first intersection that is to the left of S1, this will be the, the, the smallest value of the Lagrange multiplier, okay? So we want to average this, uh, this guy here over the distribution of psi is normal uh, zero one and the distribution of the eigenvalues of a Wishart, Wishart matrix. That's the two sources of this order, okay? So we first average over psi. So we get one over n summation si lambda minus si square. And then we have summation over lambda, sorry, l and m, um, psi l, psi m, vi l, V I M, okay? 
And since the components of the vector Xi, which remember Xi is just Sigma times B, sorry, B is Sigma times Xi. Um, the components are IAD uh, Gaussian and with uh, variance one. So this is just a Delta LM. So what we get here is just summation over L uh, v i l square, and this is equal to one because we assume by normalization of the uh, eigenvectors. Okay. So we, we have performed the average over the Xi or the, the noise uh, disorder. And uh, we can rewrite this, uh, this object that remains here in this way, one over N minus the derivative with respect to lambda of the summation over I of SI lambda minus uh, SI. So but I'm pulling out a derivative so that I can, uh, I can take out uh, a power of two uh, here. And then what I do is I add and subtract uh, lambda here so that I get a factor of minus one here and a factor where uh, SI only appears in the denominator, okay? So if we do that, then we get uh, that this object becomes minus the derivative with respect of lambda of lambda, the guy that survives here, times one over N summation over I, one over lambda minus SI. This is an object that Mark has discussed at length in, in his lectures. This is just the resolvent of the Wishart, the Wishart matrix, okay? So we get to the, uh, to the final uh, formula that if we average the left-hand side of this equation over psi, and then we average it over A or over the Wishart matrix W, which is A transpose A, what we get is that this object is equal to minus the derivative with respect to lambda of lambda G of lambda, where G of lambda is the average over the Wishart matrix of one over N trace of lambda I minus W to the minus one. Okay. So essentially we, we have an explicit expression provided that we can compute the average resolvent of the Wishart, Wishart matrix, which is something that we essentially, with, with Mark, we have touched in uh, sideways. Yes. Sorry, uh, I didn't think. Uh, you said that the, uh, the constraint lambda to be smaller than S1 to give an eigenvalue of the Wishart matrix. Yes. But we are averaging over the Wishart matrix. Yes, so uh, this, this is a notation that in, in the large and limit is a bit uh, misleading. What we, are going to, what we are going to determine is the fact that of course the eigenvalues when we average over the Wishart matrix will, will form a continuum of eigenvalue, which is the spectral density. So we, are, we, are, we will need to require that lambda is smaller than the lower edge of the marchenko pasteur essentially. Yeah, so what, what is going to happen is that uh, in, in the large and limit when we average, uh, the, the eigenvalues will, will form a continuum here, which is described by the Marchenko-Pasteur law. And we are going to impose that lambda is smaller than the lower edge of the Marchenko-Pasteur. Because otherwise that's what you're going to Of course, of course it's not, yes. So we, we are just assuming that we are taking the, the solution that lies outside of the Marchenko-Pasteur C, okay? Good, so... Um, Excellent. So 
the um, to, to compute this uh, object here, we use what, what I call in, in the handout equation 16, the average uh, trace identity, which is something that also uh, Mark essentially uh, covered. So what we, we need to do is we need to compute uh, the integral with some, some constant uh, C the integral of, of the Marchenko-Pasteur uh, density with uh, the lambda minus s that comes from, from, from here uh, under the condition that lambda is smaller than the lower edge of the uh, Marchenko-Pasteur, okay? And this integral can be uh, computed uh, exactly by uh, making a, a change of variables. And if you do that, you, you can uh, reconstruct uh, an integral. So this goes between S minus and S plus. Uh, you reconstruct an integral in dx that is of this form x, uh, one minus x divided by uh, one plus ax, one minus bx that can be computed explicitly. It is in uh, various tables. I can give you the result here. Okay, so you, you make this change of variables, the constants are, are known, you use this uh, integral and you plug it in, in here. And this is of course will become a function of this parameter lambda, which we assume is smaller than S, S minus. And then all you have to do is, is to take a derivative of this object. This is just a long but uh, trivial, trivial algebra, okay? So if you do that, you get uh, uh, an object uh, which is, so let me write it like. So A and B are these, these coefficients that are of course expressed in terms of S plus and S minus, uh, the two edges of the Marchenko-Pasteur. Yeah, so, so with, this, with this change of variables, so you don't find this integral on tables, but you do find this integral on tables. And then all you have to do is to match the coefficients A and B uh, with some particular you know, combinations of S plus and S minus. Okay, so you get this uh, equation. So this is the left-hand side of the average version of this uh, of, of that equation, which must be equal to one over sigma square. And this is an equation that you need to solve for lambda, let's call it lambda star. In, in the larger limit, this lambda star is essentially the location of the smallest Lagrange uh, multiplier after you have averaged the left-hand side of the, of the equation over all sources of, of this order, okay? Now, if you solve this, uh, this equation, for lambda star, you get a very interesting uh, expression, which is one of the main uh, take-home message, messages, which is this. So lambda star, well, I put the star here, is equal to square root of one plus sigma square. And then you have root alpha minus root one plus sigma square. And then root uh, alpha one plus 
sigma square uh, minus one. Uh, where, so uh, alpha is M over N, the ratio of number of equations versus number of uh, unknowns, which is larger than, than one. And then we have uh, a few consistency checks. So first of all, we see that lambda star, the minimum, uh, the minimum Lagrange multiplier changes sign at some point, depending on whether alpha is larger or smaller than one plus sigma square, which is in agreement with, with this, uh, with this picture. So this, this value here, I mean, depending on, on whether alpha is larger or smaller than one plus sigma square, the smallest uh, intersection here will, will happen here or, or here. It will be positive or, or negative, okay? And then we have this very important uh, combination which will play um, an important role in the, uh, in the, in the future. Now, having the uh, result for the typical smallest multiplier, we can proceed by computing the typical value of the smallest loss, okay? So what we, we want to compute is the, we, we take the H of X, which is written as one over uh, two uh, A X minus B square. But then we replace uh, for X, the solution of the critical point uh, equation. Okay, and we know that X, the solution was W minus lambda identity to the minus one, A transpose B minus B, sorry. This, this was the solution and then there is an extra minus, minus B. And then we compute this object when we take the, the square norm for lambda equal to lambda star. So uh, it, it, is, it, it is the average, but then we, we, we have assumed some sort of self-averaging from, from, the, from the beginning. So it is the average and the typical value if, uh, if our whole derivation you know, goes through. Otherwise, we, we, wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been able to start from averaging the entire equation, right? So if, if this disturbs you, this would be the average value of the smallest uh, eigenvalue. But in the back of our mind, we need to assume that this is also the typical value. So that we are not in a, in a situation where the average and the typical value do not coincide, right? It, it is an assumption behind the fact that we, we are averaging uh, from, from the, the beginning, the left-hand side of the equation, right? Otherwise, instance by instance, that equation will, will have a fluctuating solution, a wildly fluctuating, fluctuating solution, right? Which is not necessarily represented by, by its... The, the fact that typical and average do not match is not necessarily linked to a lack of concentration. It, it may be just two different quantities, even in problems where uh, the typical quantity, sorry. Ah, oh, wait, no, no, okay, it's, uh, you're right. Like, if you assume concentration, it's the typical. Yeah, if you assume case, concentration, yeah. then, then it's yeah. a given, I, I would say. Okay. Good. So, so what you have to do is to compute now this, uh, this object and then replace lambda with uh, lambda star uh, here. Okay, so you, you just need to multiply this, so you get one half of a x, which is this object here, transpose, and then you multiply it by itself. Okay, so you and then you you plug 
you compute this at uh, lambda lambda star. Of course, you need to average over b and w again. Okay. So I will not. Uh, I mean, I will just give you the the last step. So th these are algebraic steps. We are just multiplying matrices. Okay. In the end, uh, you get the following. Um, So oh, this is uh, essentially the minimal, so averaging over A and B, this will be the average value of the minimal loss. So what you get is one over two, B transpose A. So after, after multiplying matrices, which you need to average over, let's say, A or W and, uh, and B. And you, you do that. Uh, so the average over B of B square is easy. So it is summation I one to M of B I square average. And B, we know that the variance of B is sigma square. So we get that this is M of sigma square, and this takes care of this, of this average. And then we need to uh, average over B, this term here. So let's call this matrix R. So you get that the average of B transpose R B is equal to sigma square, the trace of R. This uh, a simple one-liner exercise uh, for you. Okay, so the the b uh, the b average is is easy, and once we have done the b average, we get uh, a term trace of r. So the trace of r is is a term of the, that survives is the trace of w divided by lambda identity minus w, which we need to average over W. And this can be, can be done using the marchenko pasteur uh, law. So this is, uh, this is uh, easy, okay? So everything, the, the minimal loss can be computed by averaging over the Wishart um, distribution. And, uh, and what we get in the end um, is, is this final result, which is that in the limit n to infinity, the average minimal loss divided by n is given by this uh, result. One half square root of alpha one plus sigma square minus one, where this term here is essentially what, what you had here. Uh, as well. So we have, we have a formula for the average minimal loss in the large end limit obtained by averaging over all sources of the, of the disorder. And uh, of course, we have computed this formula, assuming that alpha, which is the ratio m over, over n, was larger than one. Using a different technique, so a replica technique, which I'm going to do next and for the remaining two hours, uh, we can actually extend this result down to a critical value here, which is smaller than one. And it is given by one over one plus sigma square. So what, what is this uh, result telling us? Well, it is telling us that for an overcomplete system, typically the minimal loss is positive. So we will not be able to satisfy the system exactly, which is not, uh, I mean, it is quite obvious 
that if, if we have a number of equations that is much larger, that is larger than the number of unknowns, we would not expect uh, to, to find an exact solution. But we will, we will show with another method that this carries over to another critical point, which is smaller than one. So even under complete systems are in general not compatible due to the nonlinear constraint, okay? Only, only when uh, the alpha, the ratio is smaller than this number that is smaller than one, then typically we get that the average minimal loss is zero, which means that we can satisfy the, the system exactly, okay? So the presence of the nonlinear constraint, the quadratic constraint makes under complete systems in general, non-compatible, okay? That's, that's the take home uh, message. And, uh, and you see it, for example, in a simple example, like if M is equal to one and N is equal to two, you get a system of two, a linear system where you have one equation with two uh, unknowns, but a nonlinear constraint. So you, if, if you didn't have the nonlinear constraint, then you would have a, a, a very large number, a very large space of, of solutions. But the presence of the nonlinear constraints tells you that you get a, a real solution only if B1 is smaller or equal than a certain value. So if, if the noise is too big, then we cannot satisfy this, this equation, even though the number of unknowns is larger than the number of equations, okay? So the, the presence of the nonlinear constraint is, is actually very important. It, it may make a system that would otherwise be solvable, not solvable. And that's, that's the source of this, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, the question is, is it known if uh, below this, uh, this transition point, um, the, the, um, the loss function is in, in the, on the average is exactly zero, or if it is like a sublinear uh, term? Um, I, would, I would guess that uh, it is certainly sublinear in, in N. So what we have is that to leading order in N, the average is, is zero. That's the only conclusion that we can that we can get. But for sure, there are let's say um, order little o of one corrections to that uh, to this to this result. And uh, so terms terms that go to, go to zero when n goes to, to infinity, but it is not identically zero. So you expect that it's not In, in uh, this situation, what we, what, we are, what we are saying is that a very large system on average or typically is solvable, but a finite, a, a finite system will, will have, you know, a correct. So if you're talking about finite N, then most of the systems will not be exactly solvable. That's for sure. This, this is a statement about typical behavior in very large systems, of course. But let me let me also mention that it is obvious that this this threshold decreases, so goes to the left when sigma when the noise increases, right? The the larger the noise, the more we expect the system to be incompatible in 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 general. So this this threshold is expected to move to the left when the noise uh, the noise increases. Up to now, we only have a result about this, but we, we, with the method that we are going to develop, the replica method, we can push this, uh, this line down to this, uh, and, and this is a very important message. So under complete systems, in the presence of nonlinear constraints are generally uh, non-compatible. Maybe non-compatible. Uh, sorry, I did hear. 
uh, yeah, you, you are right. To, to be honest, I did this uh, very quickly. It might be that, that there is uh, there is an absolute value. I'm 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 not sure. I will need to to redo this more more carefully. I mean, this was just an illustration to say that there there is an inequality constraint on the known term uh, here that comes from the from the quadratic constraint. Yeah, pro yes, probably you are you are you are right. Yeah. Okay, other, other questions? Okay, well, um, luckily I can now relax. Oh, no. Actually, it's not true. Um, okay, we have a, a break, right?